open the pod bay doors now. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. What would you do with a brain if you had one? Do? Why, if I had a brain, I could... Miles per hour. I could wire away. 46, 56 degrees. As a conservation scientist working at the Field Museum, by the way, there's a new exhibit, Specimens Out, that you all should check out um, that really unlocks the doors to the back of the Field Museum and the collections that we have that scientists for hundreds of years have, have deposited here. As a conservation scientist, I'm, the science that I find rewarding and the type of science that I do is that has direct application for conservation efforts. And as Noah suggested and talked about, we work primarily in the Amazon Basin. And this is just a map to give you an idea of the science that we're doing and what that leads to in terms of protected area. Um, every area that you see there in red is already protected and in yellow is in progress on route to be protected. Um, and I think if you click one more time, that, Right now, that's totaling eight to 18 new conservation areas and about 26 million acres of land that's being protected in the headwaters of the Amazon Basin. So you're talking about the largest river system on the globe with biodiversity that's unparalleled on the globe um, being protected and is, we're working on that here at the Field Museum. Um, there, this is also new work uh, in Guyana where we're looking to help protect 3 million hectare, acre, acres Sorry, I get those confused sometimes because when I'm down there, we talk in hectares and here we talk in acres and miles. And, um, but this is a lot of land and this is the kind of work that um, in order for us to be able to protect the kind of biodiversity that we have on this planet, I have a passion for this region. Um, we also have work that's being done in the Chicago land region too. So as a scientists working the Amazon, my car is a boat and I navigate the rivers to get to these sites in order to do the work that I'm doing. We live, uh, we camp out in the forest and we stay in hammocks most of the time. Um, sometimes we have these group situations where all of us are underneath a tarp, but a lot of times we're spending many, many weeks upriver in remote areas and we are living off of the river and the forest. So working with the indigenous people, we're hunting and fishing for the food that we eat. Um, these are remarkable. Working alongside the indigenous people has enhanced every aspect of the work that we do at the Field Museum. So this is kind of what a scene would look like at night where we're sitting by the fire and throwing piranhas and every other kind of fish that we were able to catch that day for our meal. Um, a lot of the time, because I primarily work with aquatic species, I'm in the water. I've started my work working with fish, but I've also ventured into reptiles and amphibians, hence working with snakes. Um, this is the Arapaima, the largest freshwater scaled fish on the globe. And this specific species is actually endemic to Guyana, and it's only found there and nowhere else. This one is the largest one that we tagged. It's about eight feet. Um, they used to get up to about 10 to 12 feet, but it's been a really long time since anybody has found one that large because they're over harvested and they take a long time to reach that length. We find a lot of different species in the net when we're out there doing the work. And this is the giant Amazon river turtle. Um, you never know what you're going to find. Sometimes it's dangerous. Sometimes um, it's these turtles. I've also worked with snakes. Um, the first project that I worked on with was these boa rosadas in Honduras on the left side. Um, also a spilotes, a type of snake that's found in Panama. And oftentimes I just have kind of a habit of picking snakes up along the way to figure out what they are. Um, just a general curiosity for nature and in the outdoors. And so I just usually don't pick up venomous snakes. So the star of the evening, the anaconda, um, there are four species of anaconda. The, the largest species is the green anaconda. That's the one that most often is depicted in movies as the one you'll see tonight. Um, but they are often more, more so aquatic than they are terrestrial. 
A lot of times when you see them out in the wild and they are on land, it's because um, they might be a female that has eggs or they're digesting their food, but most often they're gonna be in the water. A lot of times when you see them out when I'm doing the work, you'll see them with just their nostrils kind of sticking out of the water and just hanging out because they have a great sense of smell and sight. And that's usually how they're hunting their prey. Um, they live up to 10 years in the wild, which is remarkably short, I think, for uh, an animal this large. It's the heaviest snake in the world. It's not the largest snake of the world. And I think this next picture will give you an idea of just how big these guys can get. Um, this, is a, this, this is an individual that was about 20 feet. Um, it was sitting on the bank. It looks like it might be a gravid female. It was the time of year that most often you would find uh, anacondas with uh, young. Some other facts. So, are they venomous or non-venomous? Non <laughs> okay, you can't read the slide. <laughs> so they're non-venomous, but they do have incredible, uh, the way that their teeth structure is, is, is arranged and their, their head is remarkable. So they have six rows and they have four on the top and then two on the lower and they're all kind of pointing backwards. So they have, so if you can imagine once a prey enters in, they're not going to necessarily be able to escape out very easily because of all those rows of teeth pointing in the internal direction of the snake. What about some of the things that they eat? They eat mammals, they eat um, turtles, they eat anything they can find. And oftentimes what they do when they are killing their prey is that they'll suffocate the prey first and then they will consume the prey after that. And sometimes they'll suffocate the prey and not necessarily um, eat the prey that they've killed. Um, these are all notes that I want you to think about as you're watching this film, um, because I want us to come back at the end of the film and talk just a little bit about some of the facts that I've shared with you, and then for us to come back and um, for you to throw questions to me and to each other and us just to talk about kind of the way they de depicted the anaconda. Um, their meals can last up to three months. So if they're eating something like a capybara or a jaguar that might be anywhere from 40, 50, 70 pounds, I mean, that, is, that can last a really long time for an anaconda. So they, they aren't necessarily quick movers. They're great swimmers, but you're not going to, if they are doing a very active movement, it's because they're in danger. And that's very rare to see because oftentimes when you do see them on land, they are digesting their food. Um, let's see, uh, females carrying eggs don't usually feed during that time. Females are always, uh, most often larger than males. And females sometimes eat younger males. <laughs> and the way these guys are, they breed, they have what's called breeding balls. And there are a lot of snakes that do this. So breeding balls will be like 10 or 12 males on one female, and they'll fight each other to have the opportunity to mate with that female. And then whoever wins, which is often the strongest male, gets to mate with that female. Um, gestation period is about 8 to 12 weeks and then you have live birth and when you see an anaconda with like 20 50 live two feet long snakes I mean it's just remarkable that that this animal can carry that many babies within their system so when you are watching this this is a, a gravid female on the right here. Um, it's really hard to tell. It's, I was trying to, I don't have any pictures of breeding balls. They're very difficult to find, but two feet long babies and they grow very fast within the first couple of years and then they're constantly growing, but they really slow down after about 15 feet or so. Um, so seeing those that are larger than 20 feet is pretty rare. And that's mainly because they're major threat. They don't really have predators. Now, the juveniles have predators, but the adults don't often have uh, predators. And if they do, it's usually because of habitat loss or human predation. So these are one of your top predators in the system. Um, they can take a jaguar, and they can take a caiman, 
They can take an arapaima. I mean, these are, are, are incredible, incredible species. This is actually one that was, we're not exactly sure what happened to it. Um, it was a dead anaconda that we found had a meal in its belly. And we're not sure, was in a swamp, and there were a bunch of electric eels in there. And so the indigenous people said what they think happened is that this anaconda was trying to get into, in the mix of where the electric eels were, and then was shocked to death. Because those are actually also pretty ferocious as well. So what we're going to watch tonight is a movie called Anaconda. This is a cult classic that was released in 1997, uh, director Luis Llosa, and, <laughs> and um, it was nominated as the worst film, worst uh, actor. It was nominated for a lot of these really bad um, awards, but in the first week, it it, it, the film opened number one in its first opening and for the first several weeks. Um, it's become kind of, despite this negative reception, it's become a cult classic and it's almost so bad it's good. So I want to end right there with what I have to say. If anybody has any questions right now, I'm happy to take them or if we, should we start the movie and then maybe go back to questions at the end? The movie and then questions at the end? Perfect. All right, guys, enjoy. So I think, you know, actually the scientist that they hired to, to verify some of the contents for this is a colleague that, um, that worked at the university um, in Alabama. Um, he works on a lot of the, this family uh, within the anacondas within. And I guess some of the things I wanted to, I wanted you guys to ask me questions if you wanted to, or talk about some of the things in the movies that, that you thought that was uh, sensational or wanting to know if there was some accuracy or any aspect of working in the Amazon or being in the Amazon. Um, but in terms of whether or not, we'll start with this. Is it true or false that a person could be suffocated by an anaconda? True. Very good. <laughs> so an anaconda can actually exert pressure of actually 90 pounds per square inch. I mean, that's pretty remarkable, right? Um, is it common for an anaconda to prey upon a human? No. Um, working with an indigenous community in southern Guyana, uh, I do have a story of an uh, actual attack of an anaconda on a human. And this was not necessarily on because the anaconda targeted this human. Um, this indigenous uh, guy was out putting his net at night, not very much different than the way that we would do as researchers looking for, spe for species of fish that were nocturnal versus diurnal. Um, we would put a gill net out and would wait to see what fish would, we would collect at night. And he went out to collect his fish and there was an anaconda in the net that was actually feeding on the fish within the net and got tangled up with that actual individual and that was not a very happy ending. Um, but they do not typically prey on humans, um, but they can exert that kind of pressure. Uh, do you wanna hit the next one, Noah? Or not? Okay, one thing that I will bring up really quick is they talked about this species called kandaroo. Have you guys ever heard of this fish before? It's um, a catfish, parasitic catfish. Um, I have some examples here if you guys want to look at it, but this is actually the individual that, that a lot of people fear when working in the Amazon because they are thought to swim up your urethra because they're, they're attracted to the urea when you urinate in the water. Uh, these catfish prey usually feed on the gills of large catfish so they're releasing their nitrates and they're attracted to that and so they feed on the gills of these catfish and I think that it's just actually a mistake that a person could potentially have a kangaroo uh, swim up their urethra but this is actually the fish that they talked about in the film if you want to see that uh, in the film uh, it has happened yes 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It can happen. And it's, it's typically not necessarily because they're going for your urethra, but because of the urine, the urea that they're attracted to. So they're attracted to those nitrates that are excreted by the gill of these catfish. Yeah. Do you guys have any questions? Yes, Rose? <laughs> Mm, that's a good question. I think it's actually one of the, this particular one, true or false? Um, ooh, actually the answer is in the question. <laughs> no, it's, no, no, no. I, so they actually do have an ability to sense the, the heat and they're able to sense their prey that around, around them. Typically with humans who are much larger than this particular individual of snake, they usually actually shy away. Um, I've never been in a situation where I've seen a, a snake or an anaconda and they have it turned the other way. So they sense me and they actually are fearful unless they are, they're ambush predators. So what they typically do is if they're on the river at night, they're going to seek out their prey and then they'll ambush that prey, their prey in the evening. So it's typically a caiman or a capybara or a small rodent or something like that. So they do have those heat sensing. Um, do they attack and run through air as they did in that last scene <laughs> and climb a fire escape? No, they don't. Are they immune to fire? <laughs> Definitely not. Um, certainly, why not? <laughs> the robotic one is. Um, there was something else. Oh. The regurgitation, I thought that was interesting. <laughs> so John Voigt coming back out of this anaconda, mm -hmm. that's pretty remarkable. But snakes actually do that. They regurgitate a lot of their prey. And a lot of times, if they're in a, in a, in a situation of stress and they have a meal in their, in their um, belly, they'll regurgitate it. But oftentimes, they're dead. So a lot of times, what they do in order, they suffocate their prey first then they take in their prey and they break them down over time. That's why they can have them for one to three months is because they enzymes will break down their prey over time. And so it lasts a very long time, but usually they're dead before they can even take them in. But what is impressive with a lot of snake, a lot of snake species, especially anaconda is they can actually open and unhinge their jaws 180 degrees in order to take and fully consume their prey. It's pretty remarkable. I would like to do that sometimes. <laughs> that big burger. Yes. No. Right. Yeah. No, and I mean, I think that, you know, there is actually some actual aspects of the movies that are accurate scientifically, but then it's almost like elevated to or like 10 times, you know, they usually don't feed multiple times in a day. You know, if they have a meal that's about 40 pounds, let's say in one day, that could last them a couple of weeks. Um, and they're not usually that active, especially if they're digesting. So it's very difficult to find an anaconda in the wild that is super active and moving. The young ones are, absolutely, much more so than these, uh, the larger ones. But yes, you're exactly right. They, once they feed, they're typically digesting for a long time and you wouldn't see a big bulge in their body and then they're gonna be feeding again. And usually they're nocturnal, so. I like how they consulted a scientist with this set. <laughs> We're going to take the, <laughs> yeah, you can, you better believe he got a lot of grief for that. <laughs> yes. Would there be several huge ones at the same area? That's a great question. So um, that's something that when a scientist in particular that was working in Venezuela has been looking at kind of their home range to see um, how far apart these large individuals are and what, it appears to be different in swamps, like the Pantanal of Brazil, versus a riverine system. And it's very difficult to find super large females close together. 
what you typically find is you might find a female and males that are nearby, but you, it's, very, it's very difficult to find two females, large individuals, mature, sexually mature, close by. And I think that's because they compete for these females. That's a great question. Sure, like other species. Mm-hmm. Yes, Noah. I think my favorite part of this movie is the going to find the people of the mist. Um, <laughs> this sort of like weird anthropological, like mm -hmm. lost tribe deep in the Amazon. Um, can you talk a little, would you mind telling us a little bit about your work with the indigenous peoples in the Amazon Basin? Also just like, are there really actually any, is there any word of people who still have Absolutely. There are definitely some uncontacted people in the Amazon basin. Um, a lot of, of the, um, in Peru and Brazil, some in southern Guyana and Suriname, uh, a lot of, some of these populations of uncontacted, uncontacted people are known by the government, but they, you know, have not gone into these areas. They've known and spotted their, uh, their villages aerially, but there are uncontented communities. One thing that's interesting is that when I spend time on the river with these indigenous communities, oftentimes in the evening, there are stories about, you know, kind of the way that the constellations have evolved or, you know, what they are. They're very different than maybe some of the ways that I've learned what the constellations are or what we may know about the astronomy um, of our planet. But there are myths surrounding animals. And this giant anaconda is still a myth among indigenous people. There are four scientifically known anacondas, but there is still this idea that there is a giant anaconda that's over the, the kind of the known 20 feet length of an anaconda that's known. So it's very possible. Um, they talk about jaguars being ancestors. Um, it's very common for them to refer to some of these animal species as their ancestors. Uh, the arapaima that I was working with, they talked about uh, being mermaids. Uh, it's very interesting to hear kind of the history and the stories and their beliefs about the natural world, animals and plants as well. Have you heard a creation story? Going? That's a great question. Um, not really, you know, and I think that that's something that I've never specifically asked. Um, but that has come up recently, and I, I feel like now that it's come up the third time, I think I'm going to ask them. But no, I haven't. Um, I think that, that, that most of the indigenous people that I've worked with talk about kind of their community coming from the ground up, like they've never left that region and that it started there and up. I mean, but a lot of times when, when you talk to indigenous communities within their area, every aspect of their natural world is part of their history. And even in places like Peru where invasive species like eucalyptus or trout have been introduced, you know, their connection is what they've known for a hundred or so years. So that's a great question. It's something that has come up a couple of times. So thank you for asking that. Yes. Shifting from the indigenous people to the invasive one, how prevalent of a problem is are poachers in the areas of which you work conservation mm -hmm. wise? It's a huge problem. And it's not necessarily just for wildlife but right. also for illegal logging, uh, gold mining. Um, so a lot, there are a lot of really rich natural resources in this area. Some of those areas haven't been exploited. Uh, poaching is a problem. And that's really re regulated by country. So okay. it kind of depends on where you are. You know, in Southern Guyana, where I work sometimes, it's, it feels like it's outlaw country in some ways because it's pretty isolated and it's very difficult to access and there isn't a law mm. that's out there. So I've come into Arapaima poachers um, where I'm working. Uh, there was also a uh, bush plane that was hired to take out a bunch of ant eaters, and uh, they took out a, a small ocelot, which is related to a jaguar. So it's, it is definitely still a problem, especially for the zoo trade, um, illegal wildlife trade. I get you. Yeah, good question.
Anybody else have a question? Yeah, so I've been doing work in the Amazon Basin for about 13 years, and it really varies between projects. So for my PhD work, um, I might spend, and postdoc, I guess, I would, could spend a couple, couple of months there, and then I'll come back, and then go back for a couple of months. It really depends on what kind of data I'm trying to collect at the time. But long stretches of time, come back, trying to reacclimate, you know, back to the to the US, to cell phones, to you know, this world, um, and then going back. But um, it's pretty rewarding to kind of have both of those worlds and being able to kind of see that and separate that out. Is your work now an extension of your PhD work, or did you study something? Yeah, so right now I am on the Amazon Andes conservation team. And because I focus on freshwater aquatic species, primarily fish, um, what I what the work that I do is I'll go into the field. I'm a research scientist for them, so it's a permanent position. Um, and we will assess a remote area, figure out what's there. Uh, there are other people in the different taxonomic groups, like the bird group, the reptile and amphibian group, plant group, and then we'll move that forward. There's also a social group. So they're working with the indigenous communities or campesinos, whoever is living in that area, to try to see what we can do in terms of protecting that area. So. How many times have you seen this movie? <laughs> <laughs> I've only seen it three or four times, so not that many. But, but it was pretty, when, when Noah asked me, you know, like, yeah, I think you should do a cinema science on Amazon based in, Stuff. And I was like, oh, great, I'll find a great fish movie. And I was like, there really isn't a great big fish movie um, other than Jaws. And, you know, I think that that was the idea behind Anaconda was that it would be something kind of on the, I don't know, kind of on the heels of what Jaws was able to, Jaws was able to do. Uh, and I think that in some ways they accomplished that. You know, I think that it's an adventure horror film that kind of captivates the imagination. And I mean, the Amazon really is a place that everything is trying to survive. And that's one of the things that I think about when I'm there for a long time. Um, you know, at the beginning, I'm kind of like adjusting. But after a couple of weeks, I realized, you know, I'm just, I, I've just entered into this system. And I'm trying to survive too. And the things that I fear are not necessarily things that I can see, are the things that I can't see. So parasites or, you know, ticks that, that will, you know, lodge for a long time uh, or diseases that, you know, are undiscovered. One time I came back with dengue fever and I went to the doctor and I was like, okay, I, I want to do blood work because I really want to just kind of have a baseline just to know every time I go back, you know, am I getting something or is there any new, uh, something new and just to kind of monitor my health. And she did the blood work and she was like, well, you have several unknown species, but they're not detrimental. And I was like, oh, wonderful, <laughs> unknown. <laughs> At least we can track that, but you know, we don't know what they are. Uh, and then that's what it's like there. I mean, it's so expansive in terms of just biodiversity from the things you can't see to you know, these magnificent large species that we know, like anaconda. From the movie end of it, are there, um fictitious or documentary. Are there movies you recommend that give a better slice of life about the Amazon Basin in South America? You know, I kind of have a bend Good towards... Good ones and bad ones like this. Yeah, yeah. No, I kind of have a bend towards documentaries. Mm -hmm. And, what do you, recommend? you know, and I think that the Planet Earth series is remarkable. I think that uh, they do a great job of really trying to capture what it is like on the ground. I know that the filmmakers spent a lot of time trying to capture some of these unique species, some of these unique um, climactic events, um, some of these breeding events. So I think that that is a phenomenal way to, to really have a sense of, of this particular region. But globally, I mean, they go across the globe. So definitely. Anything else? I just want to say thank you so much for coming out. We're going to have to do this again, but you all have to come back. 
So <laughs> even though you've seen it once, you can have it three or four times in your repertoire. <laughs> yes. One final question. Yes. More, more in the case of the Spanish language, mm -hmm. because it's a language that's not used in the classroom. Okay. In your professional capacity, you say that the performance of the snake or the human is just... Oh, <laughs> great question. I would love to hear what you all think of that. <laughs> the performance of the snake or the humans in this, uh, in this actual... You know, I think that because I've worked so long in this region, um, if anything is coming towards me, I either freeze or move towards it, which is really bizarre because, you know, I think that knowing that there is a predatory aspect to, to some of the species that are found in the Amazon. So if a cat's coming towards you, you don't want to run because you're done. Or when I lived in Alaska, if a grizzly bear is running towards you, why would you run? I mean, that you just, so um, there are some robotic features of the, the, the anaconda that were quite impressive. <laughs> so I would go for the anaconda. <laughs> Ice Cube or John Voight? I don't know. What did you guys think? He's so much fun being a bad guy. John Voight. Yeah, there were some good one liners that I forgot about in that. Just that sneer on his face. Yeah. Something that, it, that was pretty accurate in terms of the sounds of the forest. Um, sometimes when I'm laying in my hammock, I just can't believe the sounds that I'm hearing. And it's so loud. And especially if you're in an area where the, you have mating frogs, you can't hear from me to this gentleman here. If he was saying something to me, you, we wouldn't be able to communicate because it's so loud. And so when they had that one awful, or the puma, what, the panther scene, I guess, um, uh, that, that was pretty remarkable because it really is that that incredible and the sounds are just so vast and different and you just don't know what is going on out there like who is out there um, and the sunsets and the sunrises are pretty remarkable so yeah. well, on the same line of sounds I mean you know, I know the answer is probably no but what sound does an anaconda make other than the little pterodactyl looking roar they got going here that's interesting so is there I, a distinctive hiss or sound that comes out of that? They do have a hiss, for mm -hmm. sure, when they're pretty upset. Um, we came across one that was on a bank. Um, it was about 19 feet long, and it w looked like a large female. And I just wanted to touch it, you know? Mm -hmm. I just thought, you know, gosh, when am I going to touch a 19-foot anaconda? And, just, and I thought, you know, I'm just going to leave it. Because the Amerindians that I was working with, so the indigenous communities and British, uh, formerly British Guyana, uh, often called Amerindians, they have a lot of beliefs about touching anacondas, and especially as a woman, supposedly if you touch an anaconda and you've never given birth before, which I haven't, they, it's very bad luck. So the men that were in the boat were like, please don't touch the anaconda. And they've seen me grab snakes before, but this one, they were just like, please don't touch. But this one had a hissing sound, and I've seen them feeding before, and it really is kind of like that. It's like a lot of like of the enzymes and juices that are are coming out. To but there's not a large growling sound right. at all. No. Uh, shrieking a shrill. No, mm -hmm. and it's pretty. It happens in stages. You know, the movie depicted that this happened in one big gulp. Oh yeah. And it usually, hours. what hap it could take hours. And there have, you know, there's certainly one in particular that has, I mean, when I was working with a, a boid in Honduras, I mean, it took about 12 hours for four bats. Mm. And that's just a bat, and it was half the size. So it could take a lot of time. There's no, it's just slowly inching and taking this prey in. And usually, it's the enzymes that are breaking it down so that it can make space for that animal to, to move down into the body cavity. So, Have you been able to visit the, uh, walk across the street to the Shedd Aquarium and see the beautiful green anaconda there? I have. I have, actually. It's, 
It's pretty remarkable, mm. and you can actually see that skin shed. That's one thing that's fascinating is when you're walking, and you can see it right here in the Chicago area when snakes are kind of shedding their skin, and you're walking through the trails, you can find kind of the, you know, snake skins, and that's pretty, it's pretty remarkable to see that. Pythons. The pythons are the largest, like the longest, but then anacondas are the heaviest, and that varies. So even if you have a 19 foot, two, three 19 uh, feet snake, it, they can vary in, in weight depending on male or female, if they're sexually mature, if they have kid, babies, if they have kids, no, babies, <laughs> <laughs> eggs, <laughs> but that can vary. What kind of work do you do locally down in Kankakee? So I've actually worked locally with uh, endangered fish in this region. So working with a ichthyologist that works at the Shedd Aquarium. Cool. And we've gone th in this area to collect and monitor how endangered species are doing within kind of Chicago land. Which ones are on the okay. list? There is like a darter okay. and there is a fungulus, which is a top minnow. Um, we were looking, I think it's called the like the white star top minnow. Mm -hmm. So when you look into the water, it has kind of a star on its head. We were looking kind of for those species in Kankakee. That's a beautiful river. Oh, yeah, it is. So no anacondas there, so <laughs> no worries. You're not in the Everglades in Florida, so you don't have to worry right. about invasive species like that. Yeah. Well, that was really fun. Thank you guys for coming. I hope you'll come and visit the field. And uh, I have um, my contact information if you guys have any questions and have any. I'm not interested in keeping in touch. Thank you so much.